How does Australia compare to the countries around it? How many Australians are getting on rickety boats in search of a better life elsewhere versus how many people are trying to come here? That is the proof of the pudding for me. Increasingly, not only our young people, but frankly, most people are unable to explain how that happened. And that is a fact that requires explanation. It's not random. It's not an accident that this country is as thriving and prosperous as it is in comparison to the others around it. It's not an accident. It is a product of the fact that Western culture and Western civilization is very, very good at creating the sorts of things that attract people to come here. Safety and prosperity. Constantine Kisson runs Trigonometry, and he's been kind enough to have me on his show in the UK. He's been kind enough to come on mine. He's in Australia. And when we were last together in uh, England, I said, if you're out our way, come and see the Australian bush, I suppose you'd say in your country, the countryside. Uh, And here you are. It's terrific to have you on the ground out here in rural Australia. John, thank you so much for having me. You know, uh, I sometimes have to pinch myself because I think the first time you and I spoke would have been 2019, maybe 2020, something like that. Very early in my career, you know, budding YouTuber. And um, and here I am sitting in Australia with the former Deputy Prime Minister in, in his house where he's kindly hosting me. Um, so, yeah, for me, this is a, a, like a dream. Well, it's a great privilege for me because I, I love your quick mind, the way you see things and the way you avoid labels because uh, I don't think the old divisions left, right and so forth add up much anymore. It's now thinking versus feeling and you think. That's very kind. I try. I try. I try. <laughs> well, you make others think anyway. So, you know, it's it's a real pleasure to be here because uh, there was a very strong Australian contingent at Jordan's ARC conference yeah. where you were one of the people. And I always feel that, uh, as I said this the other day, you know, uh, when I meet Australians who come over, I sometimes feel like you're those Japanese soldiers uh, stuck on an island. The World War II is over, but you don't quite know it yet. And now that I've come here, I can see why, because I think... Uh, you, this country is nowhere near as far down the slope as as other countries in the Western world are. I think you're in a much better place. I'm not, that's not to say you're in a good place, to be clear, but much better. And I think you have a much better chance of turning things around for reasons that we can we can talk about. Well, we'll come to that. And and uh, you have an interesting ally in Frank Ferruti. He's a very well known public intellectual in England, but he comes to Australia a lot as well. And he says that he thinks that for all of our problems. We remain a country with the largest sort of bulk in the middle of sensible people who can still turn things around. And uh, I'm working on that principle because obviously I I love Australia. But um, since you're here on the farm, and as I was saying to you this morning, I grew up here, grew up in this house. Mm. Mum and Dad built it and moved in about the time I was born. Mm. We are shaped by our early experiences. Mm. And so living out here, I learned very early on that, there's a lot we don't control. And that's a powerful thing for a person mm-hmm. to understand. Yeah. Uh, we don't control the seasons. Australian agricultural sector is a, an exporter, so we take global prices for everything we produce here. If they're low or the dollar's against you or whatever, you suffer. You learn you can't just say, hey, government, play God and fix my problems. So that's part of what I've learned. There's also the aspect of beauty. Beauty is a great gateway to stopping and marveling and thinking things through. Mm. How did your very early years, we've touched on this, but just recap, how did your very early years shape your worldview? Well, number one, uh, growing up in a country like the Soviet Union and early 90s Russia too, uh, makes you anti-utopian pretty quickly. <laughs> the idea of utopia as, as a thing that might be possible uh, just doesn't exist for people like me. Uh I'm inoculated against much of the uh, of the cultural malaise that we are now seeing in the West. Uh, this idea that we're going to create some perfect society if only we could, you know, put the right people in government or whatever, or create the right government structure, <laughs> it seems highly suspect to me based on that. Uh, but uh, like you, to a lesser extent, of course, but like you, I spent a lot of my happiest memories actually as a child were uh, summers on my grandfather's farm in Ukraine, and. Uh, again, you see the real world. You know, I worry about this for my young young boy growing up. You know, he's going to think food grows in the supermarket. You know, 
Um, whereas we, we would get grow things, eat the things that we grew. I would get chicks, raise them, and then yep. my grandfather would slaughter them, and then we would eat them. So this whole life cycle of mm. existence was there before my eyes, and I saw it from an early age. So that connection to reality, you know, a lot of the uh, ideas that we are often critiquing, you and I both, I think they are a product of the fact that the people that are tempted by them are increasingly detached from the real world, which is one of the reasons I think Australia is in a better place, because if 60% of your economy uh, is digging things out of the grounds and shipping them somewhere, it's kind of hard to be woke down a mine, you know what I mean? Uh, you are doing things in the, in the real world with your hands. or it, 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 you, Those ideas that work in theory but don't work in practice are less appealing, I feel. Mind you, I mean, you've got huge slabs of the Australian people that now want to shut all those industries down. Yeah. The very ones that create the wealth that they then want to endlessly redistribute mm. through our parliamentary processes. Uh, we're not thinking this through very clearly. doesn't seem that you are. But as I say, I think you are in a better place. Mm. Uh, We're talking of better places. Mm. Everyone's talking about Tucker Carlson talking to Putin. Mm. And you come away with the impression that we're meant to think Russia's not such a bad place and that maybe we've got it all wrong and our cultures are not good places to live in. You're pretty uniquely comment, uh, placed, I think, to comment on, on that. Yeah, so uh, we did a whole breakdown of the interview that Tucker did with Vladimir Putin on, on trigonometry. Um, it, it, it's got 600,000 views or whatever. So people have gone to see that. My issue, I, which I think you're referring to, is I wrote an article called Tucker Carlson and the Woke Right. Um, and my assertion is that there are a lot of people in a position not dissimilar to Tucker, um, including here. I've spoken to some people with this kind of worldview, which is it's a mixture of things. I mean, one of the, one of the crucial elements, I think, when it comes to foreign conflict in particular is a lot of people my generation and older and younger actually felt extremely misled by the war in Iraq. And I opposed it at the time because I thought it was a foolish and deceitful effort. But people like Tucker who supported it enthusiastically and others who supported it enthusiastically uh, are now disillusioned. And I, the reason I warned against the Iraq uh, invasion, one of them was I felt that it would massively undermine our ability to act in situations we actually do need to act in to protect our own interests, which I didn't think that particular conflict was about. And I think that that's part of what drives Tucker. And my disappointment with him was the videos he did afterwards. The, you know, look how brilliant the Russian metro is. Look how cheap the food is. Yep. And the food in Russia is not cheap. It's three times more expensive in terms of affordability for the average Russian. Just say that again. That's a really important point, isn't it? It's about affordability. Yeah. So, yes, if you're an American who makes yeah. however many millions of dollars a year, as Tucker does, and you go to Russia, yes, food is cheaper. But if you're a Russian, you are going to spend 30 33% on average of your household income uh, on food with, versus 11% for an American family. Um, so, and quite a lot of Russians spend 50 to 60% of their income on food. If you think about that, that, you know, it's really, um, you're spending most of your money on food. Um, so the idea that food in Russia is more affordable for people is just absurd and completely untrue. And I think it, you know, I have some experience of this and I wrote in my article about, about the fact that having been on Tucker's show numerous times to talk about things on which we agree, um, I then offered to talk to him about Ukraine and to challenge some of the things that he was saying that were absolutely not true. The, the idea that the Ukrainian a government is persecuting Christians, for example, which is just a complete fabrication and misrepresentation of the conflict between the Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in Ukraine. To present that as the persecution of Christians is deeply dishonest when what's actually happening is uh, there is a church that is headed by the patriarch of all Russia, Kirill, in Moscow, in Ukraine, that to a large extent was collaborating with the enemy. Uh, and so that conflict within the church and between the church, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church and the government is not a conflict between Christians and the Ukrainian government. It's a factional conflict that that is very likely uh, to occur in those kind of situations when there's a war going on. And these things are not just about matters of opinion. They're about what is actually happening on the ground, right? The conflict and who supports what. So when I offered to challenge Tucker on all of this stuff uh, and to discuss it, the the pushback was very much... 
you know, no, we're not interested. The debate will get heated, uh, which I find strange because Tucker often has heated debates. And as we know, I think heated debates will tend to do well uh, in terms of viewership and so on. Um, there was a kind of ideological don't talk about this to the point where when I did pursue it and kind of pushed it, I was basically told, like, if you carry on down this path, this will be bad for you. Like, we won't have you back on. Um, which which is fine, by the way. People, you are entitled to have people on your show and not have people on your show. I'm the same. That's absolutely fine. I just think it speaks to an ideological blind spot that most people will have. I, I have them too. We all do. Very common in the West to have had ideological blind spots about Russia. You got to remember just how many, particularly mm. British intellectuals, yeah. were in love with the communist model in the 1930s. Yes. And Irish, as I give an example in my article, uh, I mean, George Bernard Shaw, brilliant man, absolutely brilliant man. And by the way, like Tucker, principled, intelligent, you know, a, a challenger of dogma, uh, very independently minded. The, the people, we've got to this world, John, as I think you'd agree with me, where we we struggle to criticize people's positions or ideas because criticism of someone's ideas is immediately conflated with criticism of the person. Yeah. That's not what I'm doing. People are entitled to have ideological blind spots. I certainly do. And I would want people who see those spot blind spots that I have to treat me as a rounded human being is to say, well, he's not doing that well, but he's doing that well. Um, so I wasn't having a go at Tucker but I do think on this particular issue, he's not seeking the truth. And I think that's a fair comment for me to make. Uh, and I just felt that the reason that he's uh, doing what George Bernard Shaw did with Stalin, where he goes over in 1931, he has a two-hour private audience, and he comes away absolutely wowed. And, and um, you know, when he was leaving the Soviet Union in 1931, he left them with the words, I leave this country of hope and optimism to go back to the West, our countries of despair. And I think that is where what this idea that I'm talking about the woke right is coming in from, which is there are people in the West who hate the West, the kind of progressive woke mm -hmm. left. They hate everything about it. They hate its history. They hate that it's cis, white, male, patriarchal, all this other nonsense. Um, but there are also people in the West who are increasingly so disillusioned with what the Western elites have been doing uh, that they are no longer skeptics, they're cynics. And now they are looking to say, well, the Western elites are so corrupt and so intransigent and so irremovable, even through the democratic process, that we've got to look for an alternative. And so they look at people like Vladimir Putin, who can sit there and give you a 40-minute presentation uh, about the history of Russia uh, without notes and without falling over like some other leaders. And in the context of... Uh, where no one else knows the history. That's right. That's right. So these things are very charming and they're persuasive and they're enticing. Uh, but I think to uh, to pretend that uh, that Russia is the model for us to follow or that a kind of authoritarian 25-year presidential rule uh, by a former uh, KGB colonel is, is the way that Western societies need to head to deal with the very real problems that we have just seems to me to be a, a kind of rather naive and misleading way of looking at this problem. Seems to me there's an immense danger at the heart of all of this too. If we start to fall into that view that some conservatives in America seem to be adopting, mm. that Russia's not so bad after all, and maybe they've got some legitimate claims and they're not our priority, that's now playing over into a real stalling of support in practical terms for the Ukrainian people at a really difficult time in their history. And the reason I mention this is I'd be, I'd be interested in your views. The idea of, um, no, we need to focus on China, you Europeans should deal with the Russian situation is quite common uh, now in, mm. in conservative Republican or, or the conservative end of the Republican thinking, as I understand it, in America. More the dissident right, you might call it. Yeah. Well, you, yeah, but they seem to have quite a bit of sway. Yeah. And there's a view in Australia and in Britain, which I happen to share, that in fact it would be a terrible mistake to send a message to Beijing that the West gives up on its allies. It hasn't really got the stomach for the fight, mm -hmm. and they'll give up after a while, and that increases the likelihood of Beijing doing something... Um, 
clumsy or awkward? Well, you're a better place to analyze that situation, particularly with regards to China than I am. I certainly don't know enough about it to comment. What I would say is I, you know that from the outset of this conflict, I've been very outspoken about the need to support the Ukrainians. Uh, we raised £55,000 for the Ukrainian humanitarian effort in an hour on trigonometry. That's the level of uh, support that people felt that watched mm-hmm. our show. Uh, and I was on every TV channel that I could get my hands on talking about the situation and trying to get people in the West to understand why it's important. However, the reality on the ground is at this point that the West, it's not just that our support is softening, it has been soft. And yep. we have not provided the Ukrainians what they've needed to win the war. And as a result of that, we are now in a position where I wrote an article a couple of months ago saying it's time to end the war. It is time for the West to acknowledge the reality, which is the Ukrainians made, they had significant pro- successes on the battlefield in the early days of the conflict. Um, they retook uh, Kherson in the south. They pushed the Russian forces away from Kharkiv in the northeast. Uh, they had some successes in various other uh, points, including pushing the Russians away from Kiev in the north uh, in the early part of the war, uh, which is how we discovered the massacres in Bucha and other places. Um, but in the year since the retaking of Hassan, the Ukrainians have had no success on the battlefield. Let's be honest about that. And if we're not prepared to give them what they need to actually mm. make progress, then why are we continuing this conflict? Because all that is happening is Lots of men are dying on both sides and lots of civilians are being harmed. Um, there is no benefit, particularly given that now it looks like the Russians are actually starting to make progress. So um, it, my view is that you know the reason to have supported the Ukraine in the beginning was to help them get the best deal that they could. If you remember, this is mm. what we talked about from yep. day one. I think it's clear now they're not, they're not likely to get to a better place at, than they are at the moment. That being the case, I think the most important thing, again, I said this from the the first day of the conflict, is the Ukrainians were always going to have to give away land. The question is, can we put something in place that in exchange for that, they have long-term security? And I don't mean a piece of paper. I don't mean a piece of paper, which is what they had before. This is the second time the country has been invaded in 10 years. A third invasion would, would be the end of the country entirely. We have to find some kind of deal where the Ukrainians, yes, they're going to have to give up territory. That's the the fact on the ground. In exchange, we need actual protection for them so they can start rebuilding their country uh, and head in the direction that they want to head in, which is clearly Western. Uh, They've got to have the ability to be aligned with the West, uh, to be a democratic country uh, that is able to rebuild itself after this terrible conflict. I mean, I'm afraid that's where we are. Uh, it strikes me that uh, the two great things the world should be aware of there um, is firstly that it will send a message that the West won't see things through, mm. and that will bring huge dangers both in Europe and I think in the Pacific. Mm-hmm. Um, the second part of it is that on the sort of roughly existing boundaries, if you like, of the front, mm-hmm. uh, Ukra- the Ukrainian people would be giving up a lot of their natural wealth and uh, some of the most productive parts of the country, wouldn't they? But the question for, for, for you in this situation, I'm keen to hear your thoughts, would be if there's clearly not sufficient political support for giving Ukrainians what they actually need, what do we do other than what I'm suggesting? Oh, I don't argue with your proposition. I, uh, I think I would simply say my personal view is that we ought to see it through. We should be standing really enthusiastically and my own country loves to pat itself on the back for what we've done when you actually look at it. It isn't very much. Mm. It's not very much at all. Uh, Europe, you know, with a few notable exceptions, particularly on the eastern side. I mean, the Polish have stepped up, absolutely well, astonishing. Well, but in most percentage Europe terms, has been the support inadequate. Well, in, sorry, in, in percentage terms, the support in terms of percentage of GDP contributed. All the countries in the region are the highest contributors. Yeah, and that's because they understand yeah. the danger. Um, I agree with you. What we should have done is given the Ukrainians artillery at a scale that allowed them to have parity with the Russians or more. Um, we haven't done that. The, we, we should be honest about that. We we did not give them the support they needed. But now that that is the case, it is not, in my mind, beneficial to the Ukrainian people. I understand your thesis. To continue yep. that fight. Yeah. And 
So it brings legislators and decision makers, policy makers in the West to the pointy end. Make up your mind. The worst thing you can do is to not make a decision. That's it. That's it. So you either go all in yep. or, or you wrap it up. That's that's where we are. How dangerous is Russia going forward in your view? How long can the Russian people put up with 40%, I understand, of their GDP, 40% being diverted into defence spending? Oh, indefinitely, I would think. They'll take that pain. Oh, absolutely. It's something we don't understand about For the glory of of Russia and for loyalty to the leader. I I don't think the the idea that there's some kind of brewing a revolt in Russia is complete nonsense. Um, And Putin, by the way, has, uh, you know, he's been challenged. I mean, Prigozhin was a wake-up call. Uh, but he he's got a firmer grip of the country now that than he had before. He's got rid of every challenger from left and right, and it wasn't just Prigozhin that he took he took out. He also imprisoned Igor Strelkov, mm. who who Girkin, who was a uh, uh, one of the people involved in the original so called rebellion in 2014 against Ukraine, yeah. who was a hardliner who was critical of Putin for being too weak on Ukraine. Um, and of course, the liberal opposition is in tatters as well. So uh, Vladimir Putin has locked locked down the country in terms of his control, and uh, as long as he is in power, um, they, they, you know, the Russian people will tolerate what what they must. Uh, so yeah, he can carry it on for a long time. However, I think we have to also, you know, take some reassurance from the fact that um, this hasn't been the invasion of Vladimir Putin intended. Mm. We should be clear about that as well. He thought this would be over in a matter of days, yep. that the Ukrainian people would welcome their liberators with bread and salt. Um, he did not anticipate the losses, the financial impact, um, the reputational impact, the international isolation that he's under. These are not things that he would have aspired to particularly. So in terms of deterring China and further Russian aggression, uh, I do think the support the West gave has been beneficial because I don't think the Chinese will be looking at what's happening in Ukraine as an overwhelming success for the Russian state. Uh, I don't know if you agree with that. Mm. Um, Just reiterate that point again, sorry. Uh, I don't think that what's happened in Ukraine over the last two years will be seen in Beijing as a model for emulation. No, it won't. The, the, The greater thing to understand, though, is what conclusions Beijing draws about the sticking power, the staying power mm. of the West and its belief in its own values. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, we give them plenty of evidence and they play it up that we're divided, mm-hmm. that we're not self-confident, that we don't believe our own values uh, and that we're also degenerates, that, that, that we're becoming morally disoriented. Uh, and, and that's the danger. No, 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 China would be far too smart to emulate what happened there. They're untested, of course. We don't know how their, 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 their men and women, mainly men, of course, would go in armed conflict. And we hope it doesn't happen to that. Mm. And no one, you know, it's an important distinction often made in this country. We, we recognise fully that this is the Communist Party of Beijing. In a way, communism's a bastard offshoot of the English and or of the European Enlightenment. Mm. Think of where Karl Marx came from. Mm. Um, it's not the Chinese people that we're worried about. Mm. It's Beijing, but they have massive internal problems of their own as well. So it's very hard. It's a very fluid place. And that takes us right back to the things that you and I have talked about. You said something in trigonometry that really jumped out at me because I think it's true. So why am I asking you about it? I just want to draw it out. You said that you can't ask young people to believe in democratic capitalism if it's not working for them. Mm. I think there's a lot of truth in that. I've tried to say it in other ways as well, that that you can understand why a lot of young people in the West are a bit disillusioned. The trouble is that they're looking in all the wrong places, I think, for the answers. But what did you mean by that? Well, I was asked at an event here in Australia, in Melbourne, um, Glenn from the CIS was interviewing me and he said, you know, the, the numbers are, that, you know, 20% of Australians don't think democracy is a good idea. Thirty. You gave me all these numbers and I, I, was, I was amazed that it was that low. I, yeah, well, I think that's conservative. I've heard much higher figures. Right. So for young people in particular, if you think about uh, the, the deal that I think about in our societies. The deal is that if you work hard, 
and you are talented and determined and driven, and if you do all the right things, then you will be able to do the things that human beings have always wanted to do, which is start a family, have your own place, uh, raise your children, uh, and be comfortable effectively. That's what the average person, I think, seeks. That's what we all seek. Now, the best way to, to do that is to... How, how does a, a normal person save money? Well, for most people, the ability to put away thousands of pounds every month is just not on the table. Most people are, you know, it's very difficult, uh, even on a two-person yep. household salary, uh, to, to actually be able to save any money. The only way that you really can is you buy a property, you pay off the mortgage, and then you've got an asset. Well, that is increasingly unavailable to people both in this country and in the UK, and increasingly even in America. Um, and what does that mean? Well, it means that you've got young people living four to a shared apartment, uh, unable to, I mean, who's going to, you, you know, I, I hear a lot of conservatives sometimes talking about, oh, they need, you know, look at our birth rate. We've got to encourage people to have children. And I agree. We've absolutely got to encourage people to have children, not only because of some abstract birth rate, but it's also because it changes how you think, as you well know. And it gives you a stake in your own society. The antidote to selfishness, bringing a little one into the world. The an antidote to, to not only to selfishness, but also to nihilism. It gives you a purpose and a reason to think that the future of your society matters because it's not you that's going to be living in it. It's this beautiful creature that is completely helpless and powerless that you've brought into the world that you are responsible for. Now, if we agree that that is essential and people, it's essential that people are able to do that if they so choose, we have created the conditions that have made it as difficult as possible for people to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, you know, and it, we, we know that the figures, I think 80 something percent of women say that they, they would have more children if they could, more than zero or more than they currently have, but they are being restricted from that. So, um, the material circumstances of people's lives are not conducive to them believing that the way we run things is good. Look, I think there's a lot in what you're saying, but let's tackle one issue. You're talking about the need for more kids. A lot of young people think that's the world's problem. Um, you know, too many people, it's threatening the planet. It's, uh, you know, we don't want to bring children into this mess. Uh, how does that fit? But it's because you've got cause and effect reversed. The reason young people are nihilistic is because they don't have a future. And when you don't have a future, then you become nihilistic and you start buying into all this climate catastrophe, disaster nonsense. And then you are sort of in that space. But most, I, the polling shows that, as I said, young women want to have kids. They just don't have the ability to do so. So um, I, I, I think this nihilism comes from people's material circumstances. Uh, and if we change their material circumstances, th th their entire experience will be different, and then they will say and think different things too. Because uh, in many parts of the world, you've got a depopulation bomb going off right now. Absolutely. China being the leading example, but there are many other countries with it. Including all Western countries. Africa and the Middle East, the only countries still expanding. Yeah. And in this country, I would suggest that very high levels of immigration, our leaders are not being honest. They're not saying uh, that one of the reasons is that Australian-born young people are not having enough children of their own. So you bring in lots of immigrants, but there's no housing. So the young people who are here, whether they're of immigrant stock or not, don't have kids. So you have to bring in more immigrants, and it's a vicious cycle all the way down, unless you break the cycle by building enough houses and giving the people who are already here an opportunity to start a family and be able to afford to raise kids. Why don't we start there? You know, and by the way, you know, this is one of the reasons that I, I kind of talk on conservative leaning platforms about this, because, you know, conservatives tend to be older towards the boomer generation who, you know, boomers get a lot of criticisms. But on this issue, I have to say your generation has kind of pulled up the draw, drawbridge a little bit. Uh, are you suggesting as a boomer I might have something to answer for? Well, <laughs> I, I think... Look, a lot of us spend a lot of time talking about how young people are naive and stupid and they believe this and they believe that, which is true. But we also got to look at what they're facing. They, we've talked about the housing issue. They're also facing the fact that not only they, but probably now their grandchildren are going to be paying for the money that we've been spending on our quality of life. Less of a problem in Australia, but still a big problem. 55% jet to DP ratio. 
In America, it's 100%, and likewise in the UK. We're doing crazy things. I mean, interest repayments in the UK on our national debt are one of the largest items of expenditure. It's the fastest growing in Australia, too. And, and we have a real- This is madness. Yeah. You're being incredibly kind, because I know how blunt you can be. In that, I, I, I detect a sort of, you boomers have got a few things to ask for, and I agree with you. Oh. I'm going to be really careful here, because- I know many of my listeners will say, come on, John, we've worked hard all our lives, stop this business. You have. Saying it's our fault. Yeah. My line is quite different. I'm not after that. I'm not, you know, I, I believe in prosperity. I believe in people having a go and building a lifestyle. That's not the problem. I'm a mid baby boom. I'll tell you where I am highly critical of my own generation in two broad areas. Mm. The first is the one you touched on debt. I was part of a reforming government. We got rid of debt. We left money in the bank. That's the best youth policy you can have. Mm hmm. To avoid intergenerational theft. I'm staggered at what has happened in England. I don't know whether young Brits realise what a bomb they're being left. Your tax rates are high and than they've ever been. They're climbing higher than ever. Your unfunded liabilities like pensions going forward are off the chart. And here's my criticism of boomers. We had our hands on the levers of power when we should have been doing good policy. So that's not your average voter who wasn't didn't have their levers on, although it's reflected in the way they voted. Oh. It's the fact that after the great financial crisis, the reality is that instead of what doing what we did, and now I'm sounding you know, positive about the government I was part of, and paying down the debt and ending the intergenerational debt, they went for soft options. They went looking for inflation deliberately rather than paying down debt, rather than imposing tough decisions on people. And that drove up equity prices and land prices, part of the reason why young people are having a tough. The other reason I'm down on my generation is we let the idiocy get away at our university. Oh. It was our fault. Why were we not pushing back? Go to America, the greatest generation. They're all gone now. But if you go back to when I was about your age in the mid-90s, late 90s, a roughly half the academy in America was to the centre or the right or the centre to the left. That's not true anymore. The long march through the institutions. And my point here is that what they've done to young people is give them a completely distorted view of reality. So they reach out to the very solutions that will make the problems they're worried about worse. This is what Orwell meant when he said, he who controls the past controls the future. Yeah. By rewriting history and destroying people's ability to think about the history in a contextualized way, uh, they've ruined the minds of a lot of two, maybe three generations now. But what you're talking about in terms of the first point you made is, that I think, I, I imagine you'd agree with me, we, we, it's weak leadership. We don't have leaders who are prepared to say, I know you don't like hearing this, but it is the truth. And if we do not have leaders who are prepared to do that, we will keep making terrible decisions. Because it's easy, lying and uh, appeasing and pretending and taking the easy route. It's easy, but in the long run, it builds up tremendous costs. And that's what we are now seeing. And we need leaders who are prepared to stand up and say, I know that this is going to hurt now, but we cannot continue to spend our grandchildren's inheritance. We can't do this. It's immoral, among other things. But at the first principle, it's immoral. And secondly, the practical consequences are going to be terrible for everybody. So we need better leaders. We need, we need leadership who, you know, I said this the other day when uh, I was kindly invited to Parliament House. Somebody asked me, you know, leadership. We need leaders, to put it very bluntly, John, to strap on a pair. That's what we need. And by the way, I think this attitude that we've got to pander to the people and tell them only pleasantries that they would like to hear... I think it's incredibly disrespectful to the average person who has a lot more sense than many of the people in the media and in the political class. Most people understand because they have to run a household and put up with the fact that their resources are limited, that you can't spend money you don't have forever. They understand that if someone says, look, we've had a difficult month this month, you know, I, I wasn't working quite as much. We haven't made quite as much. We had a, a household bill come through, whatever. We don't quite have the opportunity to go out for a meal this month or next week or whatever. Most people get this. And if politicians were willing to be honest with the public, 
I actually think they would get a lot more support than they think they would. I really, really do. I agree with that. You made a very interesting comment earlier about the, you know, um, skepticism being useful in public life, cynicism being caressing and mm. obstructing. And we've made that switch. So we're now openly cynical and we don't trust anyone mm-hmm. and we don't believe anyone because no one's believable. And I'll give you an example. A very, very senior journalist in this country said to me the other day, he's trying to put together a piece on the utter dishonesty we're getting from our leadership at the moment about climate change. Mm. The dishonesty he's talking about is not to argue with the science. It's something else I've been saying for a long time. Guess this issue of trust. We've got a huge debate going on in Australia at the moment about the cost of living and governments are pretending they can solve it with all the solutions that are going to make it worse, by the way. But here's the great lie. Of course, if you're worried about emissions, you're saying human beings are overdoing it and we need to reduce your living standards. And so you're saying to young people who are worried about climate change, um, we'll get you a, a secure future without being honest and saying, actually, we've got to look, lower your living standards. There is no other way around this. This talk about it, you know, a, a new economy built on renewables being prosperity for everybody, nobody really believes that. There's no leadership. Leadership would demand that you actually level with people and say, we've got to make these massive changes, if that's what you believe, and they will result in lower living standards. It is not true that renewables are cheaper in this country, for example, than coal. They're not, and they never will be. And no one even points out, for example, these massive solar farms we're building. You've got to go and replace them all within 20 years. Replace them all. So there's this incredible walking of both sides of the street. I guess my question to you is, do you think people sort of instinctively understand that they're being misled? Uh, Some people do and some people don't. And if you remember my speech at the Oxford Union, which did crazy numbers online, in which this is the the great tragedy of my career. I keep getting recognition and and opportunities because I'm saying really obvious things that everybody knows. I'm just one of the few people prepared to say them. All I said in that speech, all I said in terms of the climate issue was, Poor people do not want to stay poor. That means they're going to keep growing their economies. And that means that the way to solve climate change is going to be through technology and getting better at resource efficiency, etc. You are not going to get people to reduce their living standards. You are just not. And, and everybody, broadly speaking, knows it when they hear it, but you don't hear it said because it's unsayable in the public space. When I, when I watched that, I immediately thought... Uh, Indonesia, fourth most populous nation on earth, rising out of poverty in many ways. In many ways, an admirable people doing amazing things, you know, mm. great challenges. But my understanding is somewhere between 100 and 150 million people in that country still spending 90% of their income on food. So given that cheap energy is critical to the cost of food, the slightest interruption and suddenly you're pushing people back into a situation where they can't feed their kids. They don't care about the environment when that happens. They care about feeding their kids. I had um, lunch with uh, the the Indian ambassador to the UK uh, a few few months ago, actually after I gave that speech. And I asked him, what do you think about what I've said? And he said, when when India became independent in 1947, life expectancy, average life expectancy, I think was 32. 1947, John, within the lifetime of many people who are alive today. Today, it's over 70. How, how did that happen? It happened because they're burning fossil fuels and they're using energy to make the lives of their people better, to make sure that their infants survive longer and they've massively cut infant mortality. You think they want to go back to 1947? Don't, don't be silly. This is nonsense. So the idea that we're going to prevent billions of people, which is who is causing most of this uh, emissions now, to to reduce their standards of living, to watch their children die in agony from preventable disease or lack of medical care or whatever, it's not going to happen. So we should stop pretending. But again, this is a question of leadership. And I just I think we've got ourselves locked into a vicious cycle. The media wants to present politicians as liars. Therefore, you get politicians who are liars. We then have contempt for them. No one then wants to go into politics who's honest. And it just goes round and round and round. And somebody is going to have to come along and break that cycle.
Well, so do the better. It really is. And they're going to have to be people who clearly understand that the Western experiment has produced the best results for people, even if you talk about that doubling of lifespan in the developing world, because it's essentially happened under the stewardship of the West and the Americans leading it, whether we like it or not, a st- reasonably stable global order since the end of the Second World War, especially given that the Cold War didn't develop into a hot one. It's a bit about scientific research. And not many Australians know this, but the role we played in the Green Revolution, doubling those lifespans in the impoverished part of the world, it's the one area where Australia is punched way above its weight. Oh. Even today, we're amongst the seven biggest investors in agricultural research for the benefit of the less well-off, oh. six countries and the Gates Foundation. Uh, but it's also been affordable, available energy. All of those factors, they're all at risk. And nobody's talking about the trade-offs. Let me come to something else. Um, on social harmony and an understanding of ourselves, on trigonometry, you recently had uh, uh, Suella uh, Braverman, she pronounces it. Braverman, I think. I keep getting it wrong myself. So, uh, Well, you don't mean I get it wrong. I get your name wrong sometimes, my great embarrassment. Um, but you had her on. I mean, she's a very gutsy lady. She's been saying some very blunt things, and her heritage is not 100% English in itself, is it? But she understands the importance of the West. Um, she said it's time for us to think through carefully, uh, thinking around multiculturalism and what have you. Um, how do you see that yourself? Um, I, I'm worried, to be frank, that often multiculturalism has meant that we apologise for our own at times when we should be saying, no, actually our culture's got this bit right. Don't abandon it. So, uh, yes, it was a, a pleasure to interview Suella Brown. She was a, a recent Home Secretary, actually, uh, and she was very blunt uh, about many things, which I appreciate. I mean, one of the points that she made is essentially that the current Conservative government, which has been in power in the UK for 14 years, uh, does not want to solve the immigration problem that it keeps telling the public it does. Uh, they care more about GDP than delivering on the promises and the commitments they made to the British people. So when she attempted to deliver the policies that they committed to 14 years ago, uh, she was met, according to her, with a wall of resistance cascading from the prime minister down to other cabinet members who basically don't want to reduce immigration because it's a way of keeping growth numbers palatable to the public. Uh, And on illegal immigration, uh, there's simply not the political will to leave the ECHR, um, which means that we have no control of our borders. That, that was a couple of the things that she said, and she's made comments about other things uh, in recent days as well. And one of those is, of course, that after the scenes we saw in Parliament a couple of weeks ago now, uh, where the procedures of the House of Parliament were ignored by the Speaker uh, because of fear of Islamist violence against Labour MPs, um, she basically said the Islamists are in charge of Britain, which is a strong statement to make. I, I And I think it's perhaps a little bit lacking in new ones. I don't think Islamists are in charge of fixing the potholes outside my house or setting tax rates. But I think what she meant, and I think she's correct, is that fear of violence from certain people, Islamists, is now in a position to determine how we do our democracy, which is an incredibly dangerous place to be. Now, as to multiculturalism, and I think this is really important that we get the definitions of these words right, particularly here in Australia, because I get a slight sense that you use that word in a different way uh, to us. Here is what I think we ought to mean when we use these terms. We are living in multi-ethnic societies. Yeah. That means that we have people from different backgrounds, different, different ethnicities who may have been born or whose parents may have been born in other places who look different. And uh, those societies, I actually think, have the potential uh, to be stronger than Monoethnic societies in some ways, even in biology, is this concept of hybrid vigor. When you have racial mixing, it produces offspring that has the benefits of both sides. So uh, the idea that we need an ethno state that is entirely monolithic, I think, is excessive. Our societies that have mixture, a mixture of people can be very successful and very cohesive if we take the best from the different cultures and the different backgrounds of people. We have the talented people who've come from all over the world to our societies to contribute. But the only way that works is that we have monoculturalism, not multiculturalism, where everyone is encouraged to stick to their own and think the way that their parents thought in the country from which they came. 
Uh, It works if there's an overarching identity and we say, I may have been born in Russia, you may have been born in Australia. So Ella Braverman was born in London, but her parents were born in different parts of the world. And we all come to Britain and we become British. It does not mean that we must force people to reject their heritage at the door. But what it does mean is, as my parents said to me, you know, I remember when I came to school in the UK, my parents discovered that there was a clique of Russian speakers that I started hanging out with. And they said to me, well, in that case, we're going to have to move schools. And I, I, what do you mean? I've just found these friends. And they were like, look, you didn't come here to be a Russian in Britain. You came here to become part of this society. And multiculturalism has failed because it has failed to recognize the difference between a multi-ethnic society where everyone is encouraged to become one thing and a society where we have no desire for you to integrate. You want to speak a different language? Fine. You want to practice uh, a completely different cultural set of values and beliefs about all sorts of different issues that actually matter? Fine. You want to have a, a different uh, approach to, you know, you, you, you want to start advocating for a different legal system in our society? Fine. You want to uh, undermine the very basic values of, of the way that we do things? Fine. You want to live entirely within a community that looks like you and speaks a different language and, and is completely ghettoized? Fine. This doesn't work. It doesn't work. And it creates tensions between ethnic groups. Um, and, and so th- this conversation about multiculturalism is going to be, become particularly uh, strong in countries like Britain, France, I mean, Sweden, has gone very far down the route of allowing people simply to come and and live uh, in parallel societies. Um, Multiculturalism has failed because it cannot work. It simply cannot work. And in fact, it's, you know, coming back to our conversation about Russia, uh, this is by no means me saying that we should be emulating Russia, but actually this idea of kind of having an overarching identity probably works better in Russia at this point when you have Muslim populations and populations from other religious backgrounds and ethnic backgrounds who are much more integrated in some ways. They they, they may live in their own parts of the country uh, historically that were theirs, but they, they would see themselves as part of the Russian project uh, in a way that uh, many people in some communities in the West do not. A very, very senior Muslim leader, not from this country, but visiting here, said to me once as deputy PM, he said, you need to clearly understand something. A committed Muslim, his words, not mine, cannot believe in democracy. They must believe in theocracy. Mm-hmm. I've always been deeply troubled by that. Yes, I, 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 I can't speak to that. I, I don't know if that's necessarily true. My just experience with Muslims that I know personally is that there's a range of approaches. Uh, and I feel that what really has happened in the West is we have imported the civil war raging in the Muslim world uh, between Islamists who believe in Sharia law and the caliphate, which is what you're talking about, theocracy, uh, and uh, the Muslims that want nation states. I mean, this is one of the reasons that Gulf states uh, don't have this problem in anything like the same way, because they do not tolerate Islamism. And the reason they don't tolerate Islamism is they know it is a massive threat to their national state system and the hereditary monarchies that they want to maintain. Um, the, and the, there was a super viral clip recently of the foreign minister of the UAE in 2017 warning Western countries that if you continue down this path, you're going to see more extreme, extremism and more terrorism coming out of your countries uh, because you think you understand Islam and you think you understand this and you think you understand that and you are just ignorant about all this stuff. And the truth is, and I think this is borne out by the evidence, We have become more tolerant of Islamism in the West than many Muslim countries are. And this is evidenced by the fact that, for example, in the wake of the uh, protests where people are shouting for jihad and all of this stuff in central London, the UK banned an Islamist group called Hizbut Tahrir, a group that has been banned in almost every Muslim country in the world, including Indonesia, including almost every Gulf state, including every Muslim state in Central Asia, uh, because they get it. They understand that this this uh, ideology is first and foremost opposed to the idea of a secular nation state or a nation state at all. Um, 
and uh, it cannot be allowed to 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 take power or to take charge or to influence the way our parliament makes decisions these this is these people like the the woke left with whom they increasingly make alliances these people are the enemy of western civilization out of all of this how many in britain i always admire the brits we we think of them as the mother of parliaments and australia's love to knock the palms but it's still the country most of them go to as soon as they can to go and explore the, the links are very deep What's the future for Britain, in your view? Social harmony, economic prosperity, hope for young people. How do you see it from Bali? I don't know. I don't. I really increasingly don't like making predictions. You know, someone said that it's a terrible idea to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, I would say that we're we're in a bad place right now on all those metrics. Um, social harmony. I think it's clear what we're seeing on the streets of London every week uh, and what is happening to our politics, this um, sectarianism. And by the way, people like to present ethnic tensions in the UK and in other parts of the world, of the Western world as, you know, minorities and white people. This is not the case. Ricky Baxan, who I actually would recommend that you have on next time you're in the UK, um, he's written a lot about this uh, and... His contention is actually most of the ethnic tensions we're now seeing is between the different ethnic groups uh, in the UK, not white people. Uh, and those tensions are actually the, the fiercest and, and raging most because of, of the failure of multiculturalism. So on social cohesion, we're not doing well. Uh, on the economy, I think we've, we've talked about where we are on that front. Uh, our productivity is atrocious. Uh, we're massively indebted. Uh, and... Uh, worst and most worrying of all to me is that we have created a society of dependence, uh, a society in which people think that the answer to problems is more uh, of the government getting involved. Uh, and I'm not opposed to the government getting involved in things that the government should be getting involved in, but governments in general are not going to be creating lots of jobs. Um, and what happens is we essentially, the, one of the things that's always bothered me even when I was a very, very poor stand-up comedian who was ba barely making a living, is the way in British culture it's, it's very popular to demonize successful people and, and people who, who are wealthy. And I understand the history of it because if you had live in a society where you had a, a monarchy and an aristocracy and a landed gentry, it is very normal to, to connect in your head wealth with entrenched privilege and unearned privilege. But that isn't my experience as I meet people who are wealthy. Most of them are people who've created things of value to other people. That's the beauty of the capitalist system. They're people who have created jobs. They're people who've created opportunities for others. And we recently had a conversation in the media about, you know, is this person too rich to be a prime minister? And I don't have a problem with people being rich. I, I want successful people to go into politics. Um, so in terms of the idea of a dynamic economy, you need entrepreneurs and you need people who, who are going to take risks and put their assets on the line and their reputation on the line to go and create opportunities for other people. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned about where we are economically and our indebtedness is a giant problem. One of the reasons I've enjoyed talking to you now for some years is that you see things very clearly. Can I ask you a question? Don't be modest. How often do people come up to you in Britain and say, thank you, you're changing my thinking. I really appreciate it. Because this is part of what you're trying to do. you you're trying to provide. Well, to play, don't compare me to Solzhenitsyn. Uh, as I like to say, uh, I, in my ARC speech, I mentioned him, and then someone online accused me of comparing myself, and there's no comparison. Solzhenitsyn spent most of his life in a prison camp, enduring terrible punishments, starvation, dire, and brutal beatings. I went to an English boarding school. That's where the similarities between us end. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so no, there's no. I mean, don't be. I, that, that would be silly. I'll ask you back to, for speech day after that. I, I look forward to it. Uh, but yes, it was a. It's a silly comparison, of course. But um, I'm very gratified that people come up to both Francis and I, yeah. um, and say. Some people will say yes, thank you for changing my mind or helping me think about things in a different way. Most of the time, though, people just say thank you for speaking up for people like me who are not represented in the mainstream conversation. That's what people are actually saying mm -hmm. most of the time. And, and I think 
that's a service that I'm very proud to do. And I, that it's, it's the reason that, you know, people will often accuse me of being arrogant and probably with good reason. I have a sizable ego. But actually, the reason I feel confident and comfortable to say what I think in public is I know that those people are standing behind me and I'm speaking for them and speaking up for the things that they want to say that they're not allowed to say. And one of the reasons, and I keep, you know, I met um, uh, Jacinta Price uh, at ARC and yesterday at Parliament House. And I, her and I talked about, you know, the importance of using, uh, in my case, my immigrant privilege, and in her case, her minority privilege, to speak up for people who are simply not allowed to speak their mind on these issues because they are native born or white or whatever. Um, and we've got to a place where, you know, just saying the truth you have to have certain identity markers, as I happen to do, to be able to do that. Well, I guess that's my role to say it, and I'm going to do it on behalf of those people. And that's why, uh, you know, I am unrestrained and um, kind of, you know, people often say things to me, oh, you're so brave, which is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. This is the easiest time in history to be a dissenter ever. 300 years ago, people like us have been burnt at the stake, people who speak our minds. We're not. We're absolutely not. Some people were going to comment on Twitter. Who cares, right? It's the easiest time to speak up. But the reason I feel comfortable doing it is I feel the support of the people who are behind us, whose ideas and views are not being properly represented. Um, and as long as that remains the case, it will be my job to do that. And I, I keep saying this, I am the turkey that will vote for Christmas. The moment all this woke madness ends, the moment that people's voices are being heard, I will interview people on my show about their media career or their sporting career or just move into conversations with fascinating people. Um, I am not particularly desperate to be doing this. I, it's not to say I, I don't enjoy it. I do. Um, but I, I, I think Douglas Murray is absolutely right when he says, what? Think, just think of what amazing things we could be doing if we didn't have to spend our time talking about this crap. Couldn't agree with you more. Um, Solzhenitsyn, of course, it should be remembered, uh, he, his bravery and his courage played a major role in bringing down an evil regime. So that's back to your leadership again. Mm. But he said something he quoted me recently. Uh, he said, I gather, the strength or weakness of a society depends more on the level of its spiritual life than on its level of industrialization. How do you think, I mean, it, I would say that I think, you know, the West needs a major, if you like, not just moral, but frankly a spiritual reawakening, mm. some sort of awareness that there's something bigger than ourselves, that we're not up to the task as individuals of being God over our own lives. I think that's the cruelest thing we've sold our young people. They go looking for identity by looking inwards mm. rather than outwards, and they become smaller and smaller and smaller. And I think increasingly also unable to articulate why we are where we are. I mean, you talk about the Western experiment, and I've made this point everywhere I've gone here in Australia, but I can't imagine a better experiment to demonstrate the uniqueness of Western civilization than Australia. I mean, if you think about what's happened here is what the British did is basically round up a few of the, let me put it diplomatically, least law-abiding citizens, ship them over to an island far, far away with a harsh climate, uh, full of venomous creatures, um, you know, uh, on the other side of the world and leave them there for a couple of hundred years. And then you come back and you look, you go, how does Australia compare to the countries around it? How many Australians are getting on rickety boats in search of a better life elsewhere versus how many people are trying to come here? Uh, that is the proof of the pudding for me. Um, and increasingly, not only our young people, but frankly, most people are unable to explain how that happened. And that is a fact that requires explanation. It's not random. It's not an accident that this country is as thriving and prosperous as it is in comparison to the others around it. It's not an accident. It is a product of the fact that Western culture and Western civilization is very, very good at creating the sorts of things that attract people to come here. Safety and prosperity. And we have to get to a position where we all know how that's happened. That's the only way we will value it. It's the only way we will perpetuate it into the future. Thank you so much for your time. It's been terrific talking. It always is. Thanks for having me here.
And now let's uh, go and look at some kangaroos. Absolutely. And we'll see if we can find you one of those famous venomous snakes that are strange. I'm less keen to meet them, I must, I must confess. Well, uh, there are nine of the ten most venomous snakes uh, are Australian in the, in the world. Uh, All right, let's stay indoors. Ha, ha, ha.